Good evening, and welcome to uh, this year's uh, Water and Mass Lecture. My name is Xiao Jing Wang, uh, co organizer with uh, Skip Bacchus of the Methods in Computational Neuroscience or MCN course. Uh, this uh, Water and Mass Family Lecture is co hosted by MCN and uh, BMM, uh, Brains, Minds, and Machines. The course that's uh, co directed by um, Gabriel Freeman and uh, Tommy Bojo. We are delighted that you are here, and uh, you know, this year uh, this is uh, the first time that the two students from both courses are together. Uh, we are also very grateful to the uh, family of Walter Massey, uh, who generously sponsors this uh, seminar series. Um, I'm particularly pleased and honored to introduce this year's lecturer. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Christoph Koch. Uh, Christoph uh, obtained his PhD uh, in Neural Information Processing from the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, Germany, which uh, by many is considered as kind of the birthplace <coughs> of cybernetics. Um, after spending a few years at MIT, uh, Christoph uh, took a faculty position at Caltech in 1986 where he stayed until uh, 2011, when he became the founding director of the Thailand Institute. Now he is the president and chief scientist of the Thailand Institute for Brain Research. Uh, Christoph's scientific interests are very uh, broad, and he is well recognized for many contributions in the field, including the uh, pioneering work in collaboration with Francis Crick on the uh, brain or neurobiological basis of consciousness. Uh, I want to emphasize that Christoph also played a major role in uh, fostering the development of the field that now is called computational neuroscience ever since its, its inception. Many, many people really know that he was the uh, co founder of the MCM course in 1988. Here at MBL. Over you know, uh, the last three decades, this course has really attracted and trained many people in this field. As the leader of the Allen Institute, Christoph pushed for new ways uh, for a large scale collaborative brain research, which I think really uh, radically shaped uh, the landscape of neuroscience today. Uh, so please. Uh, join me in welcoming Christoph to give this year's mass lecture with the title The Diversity of Cell Types in the Human Brain. And he was our first student in 1988 in the Methods Computation Your Science, and he survived and you did well. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm greatly pleased to speaking to both of you, the, uh, the Minds, Brains, Machine, and the Methods of Computational Neuroscience, since those topics are obviously very close to my long-term interest. So today I'm going to talk uh, not about computation, not about uh, consciousness, but the other good, interesting thing with CNME cell and cell types. And I'll focus, I'll early on I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, types of cells in the mouth, but then the bulk of the talk will be about human. And, and the basic messages that we're doing, and people can now do human level systems neuroscience at the cell uh, level, where you can record from neurons, identify them, do their transcriptomics, do their morphology, do their electrophysiology, but not on a model system anymore, be that a mouse or a monkey, but actually on the, on the real thing. And for many things, it's absolutely crucial to, to work on humans. Thank you much, Gabriel. All right, so uh, first of all, just to briefly introduce us. So just because we do differ in terms of the sociology. Uh, so we, we're an independent, not-for-profit research organization started in 2003, so I'm not the foundational um, uh, um, director. There were people before me. Uh, and where, what we do is support basics, uh, basic research in the brain sciences. We've now become larger. There's an Allen Institute with various subunits. And, and it, its focus is um, all, of, um, all of biology, not just um, uh, brain science, but the institute I lead is, is for brain science. So um, my institute is roughly 330 people. Um, and the culture is somewhere between a university, in the sense that most of us, like myself, are from, uni from universities, Claire Reed, there's Stephen Smith. A lot of people that you recognize have been here for many years and taught here that have now joined us. 
But then we also have a DNA from, from biotech. We have a bunch of people that come from biotech. We have what's called um, a project management, and we have something that probably most of you are blissfully ignorant of called smart goals. How many of you know what a smart goal is? Ah, one person, two, three. Okay, well, uh, smart goal exists because it has a Wikipedia entry. It's my definition of existence. And the SMART goal stands for Specific, Measurable, Actual, Realistic, Timely. So typical SMART goal that we may have says, for instance, by Q3 of 2020, uh, 2020 make a go-no-go -go decision whether we can do a complete cubic millimeter reconstruction, electromicroscopic reconstruction of a human piece of cortex, a complete con con um, um, you know, doing connectomics in human EM. So it means we, it's specific, it's measurable, it has a specific timeline, so we have to make a de determination by Q3 whether or not we're going to do it. And then, of course, we, then we say, okay, now that we think we can do it, we're going to have milestone how, how quickly we can do it. And so this is one of the biggest difference between us and, um, and, uh, and the university. We only take on a few big projects um, uh, that, that, that require scale. Uh, and. Um, and we, we work in large teams. So the, the, the papers I'll talk about today, it's a bunch of nature papers, and paper tomorrow in, my, in the talk on brain observatory typically involve 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 people. So it's, it's a very different sociology, uh, but, but I would submit that the field of neuroscience is now mature enough and it's getting big enough funding in this country, $10 billion al alone a year, that it, um, People want return on their money. Politicians, NIH, want return on their money. And so ultimately, uh, if we want to um, sort of transition from the romantic phase of neuroscience to more mature phase, a phase transition that physics has already undergone in their large accelerator and in uh, particle physics and in astronomy, we, we certain projects at least need to be done at scale in, in, in this way. All right, so we initiated when, when I came, uh, we're talking with Paul Allen. I, we had this plan for roughly, uh, for these people, for 10 years, for a billion dollars, and we're executing on that. So that's our current budget, and it's all due to the um, generosity of one individual, who of course has passed away, but has left us his, um, his legacy. So we are here to stay. All right, so what we do, we, really, we t take on these large projects that help, that we believe help all of neuroscience at least uh, that, those aspects of neuroscience that relate to the mammalian brain, particularly the mouse brain, the monkey brain, and the human brain. Those are the, the, the systems we focus on. So over the years, we've released all, this is a timeline of all the various projects we have done. And with each one, each one, there are certain um, and unique aspects to it that makes it different from a typical, for example, what I did for 25 years at Caltech. So typically, these are large projects. We release, we make all the data, all the metadata available, including Jupyter notebooks and white papers about uh, the, the protocols, the data, the metadata. As much as we can, we can put down on papers or notebooks. We make uh, available, accessible, and we make. And you can right now, you can go to brain-map.org and you can download all the data I'm going to talk about. Uh, there's no login. There's no. Uh, there's no restriction. You can download everything we do. Uh, once it passes internal quality control stage. And then the, the papers, typically they're large papers, they only typically become available two or three years later because it's, you know, well, by the, of course we all know there's a difference between producing the data and then evaluating it and getting it through peer review. But we've never had a problem, I think this um, problem that many people believe, being paranoid, you can't sh share your data, and I think the archive shows that you can share your data perfectly well without being uh, scooped. All right, so today I'm just going to talk uniquely about cell types. So we know roughly, pretty much exactly, for 200 years now, since the early 19th century, that all biological organisms consist out of one or more of different cells, right? Cell is a basic unit of, uh, it's a basic unit in biology. And we know that cells beget other cells. Uh, and then, of course, we realized in the 19th century that there are different types of cells. There are brain cells, there are kidney cells, there are heart cells. And then with the, the, the chemical industry that gave rise to dyes, Golgi and Cajal and others, uh, showed a great variety of different types of neurons by their morphology. Right, so this, of course, has evolved over the last 150 years. So what, what the field is trying to do and what we are heavily involved in, probably two-thirds or three-quarters of our institutes are involved in this, is to come up 
with a classification, how many different types of cells are there, and can we classify them? Of course, the mother of all classification system in, in, in biology is, of course, the periodic table. Um, and so that's a, a difficult problem. Uh, people have addressed this problem before in, sorry, in other fields, uh, particularly in the field of trying to classify all biological organisms. You know, a dog is different from a cat, and how are they related to each other, and how do they differ from a lion? And so people have these, you know, the, the entire tree of life with its kingdoms and its various levels. And so there's a lot of uh, knowledge about classi uh, classification um, and uh, tax taxonomy and how to name them ontology. These are all um, fields that, that we're dealing now on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we, uh, we know from, from, from uh, those types of classification of species, one has to be very uh, flexible. You can't be rigid. You have to use uh, continuous parameters. So we typically, you all know this textbook knowledge, classify, let's say, neurons in the brain as non-neurons and neurons, and then their classes of excited inhibitor neurons, their subclasses, their types, and their subtypes. And ultimately, we want to get to this level. And I'll come back at the end whether this is useful or how useful it is or for what, use, for what usages can we put this knowledge. And the question is, how many different subtypes are there? How many different leaves are there on this tree? And by what criteria? So in, uh, in spe classifying species, it was morphology and embryology. And then, of course, everything changed with molecular biology and genomes. So same thing here, historically, the most dominant way to classify neurons, a la Raymond Cajal, is morphology. Then now we have electrophysiology, but now, of course, we have transcriptomics, the genes that are expressed inside the cell or inside the nucleus. Uh, we do all of these methods. This is all just two species, uh, uh, mouse and human, so it's almost exactly a factor of 1,000 in terms of mass. It's 0.6 gram versus 1,400 grams. In terms of surface area, it's 1,200 square centimeters, well, uh, 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 compared to a little bit under one square centimeter. It's a factor of 1,000 in terms of neurons, 86 billion versus 74 million. It's a factor of 1,000 in terms of cortical neurons, 16 billion cortical neurons, and 14 million cortical neurons in, in mouse. And so we can ask the question, and I will ask as well, where's the difference? Why are we the dominant species and not not mice, is it just because we have a thousand times more, right? And people say, well, obviously that can't be, but if you, if you look at your computers in your, in your pockets, today you can talk to them. 20 years ago, when there were a thousand times fewer transistors, you couldn't talk to them. Yet there's no fundamental difference in terms of the architecture between computers 20 years ago and computers today. All right, so I said we operate in a large team. These are sort of the, the senior scientists. Uh, 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 I'm not going to go through them all. It's really led by Ed Lean at the, uh, uh, the Schumann cell type program and Hong Kui, uh, the, um, the, uh, who's in charge of the structured science, who's in charge of the mouse, and who's in charge of uh, transgenic animals uh, that many of you, at least if you're experimental scientists, will, will use. All right, so we have these flexible uh, uh, guide to how we classify things. And we use, by and large, three morphology, uh, three modalities, now going to a fourth one. We use the morphology, particularly the classification of dendrites and axons, local, if it's in slice, and distal projection, if we do whole brain, a whole brain reconstruction that we do now increasingly in the mouse. We can't do that, at least yet, in humans. We do elect large-scale electrophysiology in both human and uh, uh, human neurons and mouse neurons. This is all in slice. This is not in vivo. So this is in a comatose piece of brain tissue. And then we use a technique that many people use today. And partly it's so it's a question of the drunkard who's looking for his keys, and he you know he looks for his keys under the street light because that's where the light is. So we're using transcriptomics. In other words, where we're looking, we're doing RNA and then reverse uh, transcribing the RNA sequence, sequences that we find inside the nucleus, either inside the nucleus for human or inside the cell for the mouse brain. We typically get between eight and 10,000 different species of, uh, of RNA that are being expressed. And then we, do we can do classification in these very high dimensional spaces. 
That's right. It's getting, it used to be expensive. So we used most of this pap these papers I'm reporting use a, a technology called Smarter, a Smart Seek version 4. It's a, it's a technique that go allows you to go very deep. But it's very expensive. It's like $30 per cell. And if you do 100,000 or million cells, that's expensive. And then some of the later results, we now use uh, 10x, which uses drop seek, which is roughly a factor 50, uh, 50 times cheaper. <coughs> OK, so, so our methods are, 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 are in the following. So we define types using different criteria. So when I refer to E-type, I mean electrophysiological -physi types. Where we do the we take out a little piece of brain, human and mouse brain, we put it in a dish. So now it's it's cut off from its input and its output. It's the, it's it's really in a piece of comatose brain. We put a, an electrode inside the cell body and we inject current, random steps, steps, uh, random noise, uh, frozen noise, pulses, all sorts of um, uh, all sorts of different stimuli to try to uh, evoke a very diverse response. And then we classify based on, we do unsupervised um, classification based on those criteria. Or we do the same thing where we, where we go inside a, uh, a slice, we record from the cell, but then we inject biocytin, and we recover the, the morphology of the cell, whether it's human or mouse, and we can see it's dendritic, it's complete, pretty much complete dendritic ABBA, and it's local axon. And we do classification based on that, unsupervised. This has a drawback that it's a comatose brain. You don't have background activity. This has a drawback that you're cutting off everything in, you know, you have these slices, 350 micrometer thin. So you don't see the distal, ax the distal axons. Then now this technique we have called FMOST, where we can do much better, where we can reconstruct neurons and their axon projection in across the entire brain. But we can't do that in humans. All right, so doing this, for instance, so we've done this. This came out a couple of months ago in Nature Neuroscience, where we do this exhaustively in primary visual cortex. We chose for various idiosyncratic reasons. We chose most of our tools are concentrated on, on primary visual cortex in the mouse. All of our brain observatory, I'll speak tomorrow, will be all in, in, in mouse visual cortex. So we go very deep in one area, and we classify, and I'm not going to go into the detail. We've classified this is mouse according to um, the uh, pyramidal cell, primarily their, their dendrites and the position of the cell bodies, whether they're in layer two, three. So in the mouse, you, don't diff you can't differentiate layer two and three. It's one layer here, layer four, layer five, or layer six. And uh, interneurons that, of course, can be found in layer one to layer six. And then also using electrophysiology, whether they, you know, they for example, in response to step, they fire a few, a few spikes and then they shut up, or whether they stutter, or whether they adapt, or whether they are high frequency firing, whether they burst, etc. And using this classification, we can f identify 46 different morphological and electrophysiological types. So different types that cluster. Uh, in these are spaces that have on the order of several hundred dimensions. Now, of course, as you all know, if you've done clustering unsupervised, it really depends a lot on the detail. So I don't, so there's nothing particular magic about 46. In the first paper that we published two years earlier, we got in 42, and I knew that was the answer. <laughs> but unfortunately, looking more, using a different clustering algorithm, it's now 46, and may well be 47. The exact numbers aren't so important and depend on, on, the, on the various details of your of your, uh, of your learning algorithm. All right, so quite a few cells, more than just regular spiking cells and fast spiking interneurons. And then we do automatic, uh, the, you know, I used to do this for my PhD, and it took me like, you know, six months to write a program to do that. We now have uh, automatic uh, code that can do sort of you, you give it the morphology of a cell, you give it the electrophysiology, and then it Using genetic algorithm, it, uh, it finds the, the best distribution of currents in the soma and in dendrites, its active models. Uh, so each one of those cells you can download, and if you want to do neuron models, you can, you can get all that data. Yeah, so as I said, all this data, whether it's human or mouse, is available uh, at that website. <coughs> OK. so. But what, what we those techniques, are, they don't scale very well. 
So electrophysiology and morphology, for those of you who've done it, is, remains very laborious. You know, we have various robotic helps. We can now do automatic uh, recording from eight cells simultaneously. But still, it's very, it's, it's very challenging. And also, biocide and reconstructions are really difficult to automate. So we have an entire group that does computational uh, anatomy. And it's, it's, it's been challenging, and not just for us, for everybody in the field. If you use GF fluorescent signals, they're much, they, they have certain advantages there. But this, the advantage of transcriptomics, you can easily scale it up to 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, or, or million. So we do this technique, and we have this pipeline that we built where you can either put in human tissue or you can put in mouse tissue. In fact, you can put in any tissue. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so he, here we put in either mouse or, um, or human tissue. We dissect, for example, only layer one or only layer four of particular parts of the brain. And uh, then we do all the magic of transcriptomics. We may uh, um, pick certain types of cells. So for example, we may pick uh, cells that are marked with new N, which is a mark of neurons, because we are primarily interested in neurons and less interested in microglia cells, for instance. And then we do, uh, uh, in this case, as I said, smarter seek uh, 4 or now uh, the 10x. And we get, so our typical read level is you know, 8,000, 9,000, for some of the big pyramidal cells, the human pyramidal cells, we may get 10,000 uh, genes that are expressed. So quite high, between five and 10,000. It's lower for glia, it's lower for interneurons, it's highest for pyramidal cells, biggest for the layer two, three, and the layer five gigantic pyramidal cells. It's like nanograms of stuff. All right, so here the idea is quite simple. You know, we have this diversity of cell, and then we use various clustering algorithms, unsupervised clustering algorithms, to get different types of cells. Partly we do this because then, with the magic of biotechnology, we can convert each one of these cells either into transgenic animal or into virus that only expresses in this subset of cells. We can then build reporter, for example, Right, where all the cells that have this particular, um, these particular genes expressed, they light up. Or you can put a channel rhodopsin in and turn them off or turn them on. Right, so independent of the epistemic value of, um, uh, of cell types, which I think remains unclear, uh, they have great practical value because they allow us to go into the system and break open the system in very deliberate ways. All right, so uh, this came out last year. So here we, we, we do a, did a deep dive in primary visual cortex. This is the back of the brain. This is the front. It's a mouse brain, of course. This is a secondary motor area, which we were interested in for various reasons. We picked two areas because that are quite a way apart on the, on the dorsal surface. One visual, primary sensory. The other one, secondary motor, because we wanted to con con uh, compare and contrast. All right, so in the meantime, we've done several hundred thousand, and the result still holds. This is what was published with 21,000 cells. We find 116 clusters. Now, once again, the exact number, is it 116 or 112 or 120, will depend on the various details. We do, di we do at least two different clustering algorithms independently, and now we work with others in the field to have as many clustering algorithms, because all this data is available, to use as many clustering algorithms as possible, and everybody comes up with a different number. But the taxonomy uh, remains pretty much the same. OK, so there are two really interesting insights here. So these are all, so all the cells divide into two big branches. One is neurons, and the other branch is non-neurons. So non, we have many fewer non-neurons than we have neurons. We did that by design. As I said, we use Cree lines and we use new N because we're primarily interested in those and less interested in those. So we, there are only 14 cell clusters here. Within the neurons, there are two broad classes, of course, excitatory and inhibitory. And within the um, inhibitory, there are four subclasses, the LAMP5, the VIP, somatostatin, PV, and the SCNG. Partly, they come from different. They have different developmental origin. They c they come from two different parts of the of the uh, of the medial eminence, so that's why they fall into different clusters. And then we have all the excitatory ones. Now, this is incredible, interesting. This graph here. What 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 does it say? Well, it says of all this, the cells expressed, 
which fraction did we find in this motor area and which fraction did we find in visual areas in, the, in V1. So the interneurons almost without a fail we find in both areas. So all these LAMP5 or VRP or SST or PV we find same cell types transcriptional defined in these two different areas. While excitatory cells are either 0 or 1. So either they're found in one area or the other. They don't seem to mix. Again, transcriptional defined. OK, so the, the, the bottom line is there are roughly 100 different cell types, transcriptional defined different cell types in these two different brain areas. The inhibitory ones are identical or very similar. And the excitatory ones are different. Now, why might that be? Well, you can think it may well be that these high transcriptional sp spaces really subdivide into two orthogonal spaces. One is a space that defines the function of the neuron itself and its input. And the other one is the set of genes that defines where it goes for output. And of course, the output from layer 5, so these are, uh, note, you have very few cell types in layer 2, 3, and 4, very few, remarkable few in either V1 or in, in, uh, in the motor areas, you have a very large number of cells in layer 5 and layer 6. Of course, those are all the output cells, and they project to very different areas. So in V1, layer 5, you're going to go, for instance, to the superior colliculus, because you need to send the information to the visual tectum. There is no projection in uh, motor cortex from, from layer 5 into the colliculus. Instead, it projects to the pons, down to the spinal cord, etc. So I suspect because th these have to carry the zip code for a distal area outside their local area. Well, these are just addressed locally, all, with one exception, an SST subtype that actually does have a long distant projection. All of these are local interneurons that don't go outside the area. So all they need to know is, well, I'm sitting in layer 2, and I have a dendrite, dendritic tree into layer 1, and I extend um, a basal dendrite into layer 3. And I can code that in the same way in V1 as in, as in motor cortex. OK, so that's mouse. Yeah, as I said, we, we, uh, s uh, some of the different class we can explain by the uh, developmental different origin from the central or the medial uh, ganglionic eminence. And we're now, we just finished this. It's not, uh, we haven't put it online yet because we, we aren't still fully done with the, the quality c uh, control, and we're probably a year or two away from publishing any of this. So we've done this now in a very large number of cells. I think the, cl the total now is half a million across the entire uh, cortex and hippocampus. And we're getting ready by the end of the year to have done this in the entire mouse brain. <clears throat> And where you can see, so these are the so-called TS in E plots, where you can sort of differentiate the cell types. So at the bottom, we, we find roughly the same rules that interneurons by and large are shared, while pyramidal uh, excitatory cells differ across cortex. We find that too across the cortical mantle. The final bottom line will be that a, a brain like the mouse has only the order of a thousand cell types. Again, this knowledge is really useful because you can, for example, I'm not going to talk about it, you can use this knowledge to build uh, tools like viral tools or transgenic tools that express, um, a, a, let's say, a promoter or a reporter in a specific part of them, which you can then use to study. So here we study the, the hierarchy that we find. We can precisely define a hierarchy in, the, in, in all of cortex, in all of thalamus, thalamocortical, cortical, thalamic, in the mouse using such, uh, using such tools. And of course, you can also do causal experiments where you perturb the system. OK, now let's switch to humans. So when, when I came uh, from Caltech to Seattle, I'd, I, I'd, uh, I'd just finished a long collaboration with Isaac Fried, where we record together with Gabriel Kreiman here, that was his PhD, where we recorded from the human brain single neurons, you know, the, the, the Jennifer Aniston uh, neurons. And so I was really gun ho and I believed that the field was ready to work with neurosurgeons at a large scale to really move, uh, to go beyond um, a mouse and monkey. Because everybody, I said, no, you can't do humans. You have to study monkey. And I didn't want to study monkey. There's nothing wrong with studying monkeys. But then you get stuck for your entire life studying monkeys. <laughs> and I didn't want that. All right, so how do you get access to this thing? How do you get access to the human brain? This is the brain tattoo. Right? 
Well, you can do what many of us do. You can do, for example, what Nancy Kamusha does to perfection. You can do all sorts of sophisticated uh, uh, imaging scans where you can get ever smaller brain areas in a magnetic scan of volunteers. It's very cool because you can do it reli reliably and safely and over and over again. But you know, the smallest voxel there, we're talking about you know, two by two by one millimeter or something like that, that's half a million neurons. And I'm interested in understanding those half a million neurons are probably for 100 different types. And so you, you, you have to go inside the skull. You can work in dead brains, so that's what we do. That's what we've done in the past, and that's what we continue to do. Well, we work with, uh, closely with coroner's office. It's a very elaborate procedure, and you have to have lots of patients because you have a very long list of exclusionary criteria that you can screen until you get patients that uh, or donor brains that have died from non-brain related uh, diseases that weren't involved in a, in a uh, potential crime. And they have to be a certain age, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And people don't necessarily donate these days anymore because they're more skeptical. It's, it's a long-term endeavor, but uh, we're doing it since many years, and so we have quite a few uh, clean brains in our freezers. The other way you can do uh, fetal tissue, unfortunately, due to our um, our administration, let's just keep it at that. Um, our administration washing that path is almost impossible. Uh, it's it's very very difficult. Um, and of course, there you're studying a very young brain. So typically, we're talking about aborted fetuses, which is the first trimester. So there's already there are, pro, uh, new, uh, there are progenitor neurons there, but it's not really uh, you know developed into neurons yet. You can do neurosurgery tissue, and we'll do that. I'll explain that. That's what we choose. Or you can also you can do brain organoids. You know, using uh, inducible pluripotent stem cell. Very cool, very exciting, but still very, very immature. Both as a field, it's only 10 years old, as well as these neurons. You wait nine months, and then you get neurons that transcriptional, uh, transcriptional or by tra express transcription factor, you can sort of equate to end of first term progenitor neurons. They don't really have action potential yet. They don't really have apical dendrites. They don't have you know, the stuff that we associate the machinery of neurons yet. And people haven't really been able to, diff to terminal differentiate these into what you and I would call, a, let's say, a spiking pyramidal cell. All right, so what we do, we either do work with a post-mortem brain or we work with a neurosurgical brain. So that's very simple. Every major neurosurgical practice will do one of two operations. They'll either do, have to remove two more. So let's say it's a deep tissue tumor, let's say in the amygdala or hippocampus. So depending on the exact approach and different clinics and different surgeons have different approaches, but typically it involves going to one of the temple, uh, medial temple gyrus. And so that in order to get to the deep tissue tumor, the t a surgeon has to tunnel through the overlying piece of brain. And that brain, a little bit is snipped off and given to the pathologist. Most of that piece of brain in most hospitals on the planet is discarded as medical waste. All right. This is really shocking. This is some of the most precious tissue there is because it comes from an, uh, from an individual who lived with this uh, brain until they're 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever. Most of that brain, we've done detailed histology, is normal because it's, it's a centimeter, two centimeters away. Not always, but most of the time, you cannot distinguish it from, from, uh, from healthy postmortem tissue. But most of the time, it's, it's thrown away as, um, as medical waste. So we've built up this pipeline to work with lots of neurosurgeons. To, to retrieve that. So within a few minutes, typically two or three minutes, we have a special uh, way to transport it and to perfuse it with carboxyl. And to, uh, so we've, uh, we have this optimal way where within 20 to 30 minutes, literally, let's say, we try to keep upper bound 30 minutes after it was uh, cut from the human brain, it sits in our lab and, and, and we, we cut it in slices and do experiments um, with it. And you've got to remember, half an hour ago, it was part of somebody's memory of their first kiss or whatever. All right. the, other, the other major source of tissue is uh, uh, epileptic surgery. Same thing. You have very often, 70% of the time, you have um, uh, off temporal lobe epileptic seizures. They originate, let's say, in the hippocampus or associated structure. And then the surgeon has to cut through the overlying uh, piece of middle temporal gyrus. So about uh, two thirds to uh, three quarters of our tissue comes from middle temporal gyrus. Most of the other one comes from anterior cingulate and other frontal areas. 
And then we, we farm it out. We've optimized this now. We do array tomography. We're now starting to do a neural pixel recording. This is in the patient with uh, surgeons. I won't talk about that now. We do single cell transcriptomics. I'll talk about this. Claire Reed is getting ready. They've done already some samplings, and we're getting ready to do a, a full connectomics of a cortical column of each human. We're doing slice physiology, I'll talk about that. We're doing synaptic physiology, we won't talk about th that. And we're doing viral tools. So you can import a lot of the viral tools, because you can't build transgenic lines, but you can use ABVs. So you can use a lot of the machinery and the enhancers, et cetera, and the attack sequence, all that knowledge you imported from the mouse, and you can t partially test it in a, in a monkey and then take it into, into human. So this holds immense therapeutic um, promise. Yeah, and so we work with a variety of surgeons at, at all the local um, um, clinics, and it, it really works great, and they all work with each other. It's, it's a great thing. In fact, on this paper, so we have a big nature paper coming out in two weeks from now. Uh, these surgeons are all co-authors. So as I said, we do pretty much the same pipeline uh, for the mouse as for, for the human. We do, again, new N, because we're more interested in neurons than in, in, in non-neurons. The study I'm going to talk about here, which we finished like a year ago or so. We have um, eight donors. Four are from uh, uh, neurosurgery and four are from, uh, from uh, post-mortem. 16,000 cells. It's all from the middle temple gyrus. We fax saw them. Yeah, so we do uh, eight. Yeah, I talked about all of this already. OK. So this is what we find. So if we do uh, clustering and then we derive a taxonomy, this is what we find in the, in the human MTG. Now here we're using nuclear RNA-seq. So typically the tissue comes from people who are 40, 50, 60, 70, unlike all of our mouths, which, is almost, which are all P56. They're 56 days old. Right? We have everything optimized for P56, C57 black, 6J. So mice are highly inbred, and you know, they're all sacrificed in the same day, etc. That's, of course, not the case with humans. So we have vastly more diversity. That, that's just the nature of the game. So um, And also we can't, so because the tissue has been like this for 60 years, dissociating it without breaking it up is very difficult. But it's easy to get the, the nucleus. So that's why we're doing nuclear RNA. And we've done in the mouse detailed comparison where we compare the sequencing we get from, in, from um, uh, intranuclear reads versus uh, reads outside the nucleus. And there are some interesting differences. All right, but so here again we have two families, non-neurons and neurons. So neurons divide into inhibitory, GABAergic, glutamergic. The glutamergic divide very similar. So here they have so sometimes different molecular marker genes, but it's the same family, LUMP5, VIP, SST, P, uh, Almobin. And then the uh, excitatory classes. Again, we find few uh, classes in the superficial layer. Remarkable few, two, three, and four. So both in the mouse and in the human, which is sort of amazing, we find effectively only one or two cell types in layer four. But we find like 10 or 12 excited cell types in layer five, the output. And we find, again, lots of them in, the, in layer five and layer six. Once again, we believe that these different branches reflect the different embryologic origin in, uh, in the medial and central ganglionic eminences. But now what we can do, um, we can co-cluster. We can now establish really good evolutionary relationship between the mouse and the, and the, and the human. Right, to answer this question, well, how many cell types does a human have? Right, so many people, certainly when I give talks and I ask uh, members of the audience, many people would assume or do assume that the uh, human, obviously, because we are so much more complex, has many more cells, that the cells are much more complex than, uh, than the mouse cells. Um, but of course, we've got to remember, people also thought that in the 1980s when they found 20,000 genes first in the mouse, and then people said, well, obviously, there are going to be 100 or 200,000 genes in the human because we are, after all, homo sapiens, right? It turned out embarrassing, deflationary for us. They're the same genes as in the mouse. And the same story appears to be true here. 
So here when we, so this is these are these clustering pl uh, plots, these T, uh, T uh, S and E, these nonlinear clustering plots, where we, we, we cluster them in these very high dimension, 5,000, 6,000 dimensions, and then project them down onto, uh, onto those planes that are most, uh, those axes that are most easily discriminable. If you just do straightforward PCA, you can nicely segregate mouse from human. But if you do this co um, 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 canonical correlation analysis, then you can see now the mouse, the different cell types cl nicely cluster human and, and, and mice. So in fact here, we cluster the uh, GABAergic using the same technique in the same space. The triangle is human and the crosses are the mouse. And you can really see how they very nicely co-cluster. So for example, Chanelle cells. There's one type of Chanelle cell in the mouse and there's one type in the human and they co-cluster. That's not always the case. But uh, at the subclass level, not necessarily at the level of the, what I call, what we call T leaves. T stands for transcriptional defined leaves. is the bottom layer of the taxonomical tree. At the level of T leaves, we get seven that cluster one to one. Most cluster at one level above the, the, and the final one. So this is how that looks. So you can uh, align uh, human non-neurons with mouse no neurons, glutamer, uh, glutamer excitatory projection cells, PB, SST, VIP, and LAMP5 cells. And you can, do, you can do the following. So you can, this is just for GABAergic neurons. So here are all the different GABAergic neurons we find in either V1 or in ALM. Because uh, I remember I told you the same. And here we find all the GABAergic neurons in human middle temple gyrus. And of course, I realize these are different areas. They're different techniques. One is nuclear sequencing. The other one is uh, cellular sequencing. These are highly outbred, hugely diverse people. These are hundreds of highly inbred mice all at the same age, lots and lots of differences. But still, when you do the clustering, you find a whole bunch of cell types where you get one one-on-one -on -one mapping, so you can make predictions. So for example, we just previously published a, 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 a Nature Neuroscience paper where in layer five, we find a cell that has a unique morphology called rose hip, because they look like rose hip bushes. Well, it turns out transcriptional defined, there is a cell that looks more like a neogliaform cell in layer one, but that expresses many of the same genes. In fact, 40 of the same genes that are highly differentially expressed that we use to cluster. Um, there's one type of Sean Lee cell. So we can predict just like, so we know this in the mouse. We've now done Clay Reed has done the connectomics reconstruction. Those specifically, uh, you know, have these nice Sean you know, these lamp and with candles. Uh, uh, and so we expect exactly the same thing to be true in, um, in humans. There we find one type of somatostatin chordal cell. So those are, are the inhibitory cells that project outside. So they have long range axons in, in the mouse. So first of all, molecularly, we find one cell type that matches human and mouse. In the mouse, we know they have long distant axon projections the somatostatin, and they're involved in sleep regulation. So the prediction would be that they also have long range uh, uh, axons in the human and they're also involved in, in sleep regulation. Yeah, this is the rose hip cell. And, and we see similarities and differences in the, in the shoe for the excitatory cell. A few number match, but then you get differences. You get more differences in, um, you get um, one cell type in the mouse, that maps onto different cell, uh, different layer four cell types in MTG, and you get uh, one cell type, the projection neurons, uh, the layer five extra pyramidal projection neurons that that break down into different cell types in the mouse. Now, of course, we have to be cautious here with the exact number. The mouse we have hundreds of mice. This study only involves eight eight humans. I mean, humans we you know we're always extremely limited in tissue. So uh, we all suspect that if we have more tissue and dig deeper, we will find more cell types. So you know, right now it's 76 versus 116 in the mouse. If we dig deeper, we're all sure we'll find on the order of 100 cell types in, in both. Now this is really important, particularly if you are in the big business of making drugs. Well, because here, for example, we show 
uh, in, in two cells that we, where we have one-to-one -one matching. So I told you there's only one type of Chanelis cell in the mouse, and there's one type in the human, and they map onto each other. So in other words, they have a large number of differentially expressed genes that are differentially expressed both in the human and the mouse that they share on the order of 40. But here we plotting all the genes, right? We have like 7,000 genes, or, or this is an interneuron, probably 6,000 uh, genes that are expressed. Here we plot on a log scale, log 2 scale, the expression level uh, of all the different genes in this cell type in the mouse and here in the human. These bands is plus minus factor 10. So if you're outside this band, this gene, for example, is expressed, you know, 30 times higher in the mouse than it is in the human. Yet it's still the same cell type. Same thing here for, for a microglia cell. So if you're, if you're a farmer and you, have a, uh, you used to have a large mouse lab, because of course they all shut them down, and you study this receptor, let's say somatostatin receptor, or serotonin receptor, because those are all the psychoactive drugs, and you, do, you, you have a cell type and you can successfully label that, and knock it out and get some behavioral phenotype, well, there's no guarantee that that, that, that gene is also expressed in the, in, the, in the human. So in fact, you can, we, we're putting this tool online where you can, for each of these cell types, you can differentially look your favorite uh, gene. So for example, oxytocin, which we know critically involved, you know, in social behavior and autism, etc. So here what you can see, uh, this is on a log plot, this is log uh, 2 to the 0, so this is 1, 2 to the 10, so this is 1,000. So these are the violin plot of the expressed gene cannabis, uh, um, uh, cannabis receptor 2, cannabis receptor 1, adrenergic receptor oxytocin. So it always shows that the open ones is the, the, the distribution of, of that particular gene in the different cells in the human and in the mouse. And so you can see many are similar, but many are very, very different. Where well, you have a high, uh, you know, highly oxytocin expressed in some cell type, somatostatin, in the mouse, but not in the human and vice versa. And so this really helps explain why most mouse models have been a failure. The principles are very similar between mice and human, the principle of processing but the details differ, and of course, the devil is in the details. All right. Yeah, so he, here to show the principle, right? So let's say hippocampus, you have a lesion here, has to be taken out, either a tumor or a lesion that gives rise to seizure. So the surgeon will tunnel through here and will cut this out, this part of middle temporal lobe, and give it to us. So, you know, it can be like this, looks like a piece of sushi. <laughs> Sometimes bigger, sometimes it can be as big as this, very often it's smaller. On average, it's like a cubic centimeter. So think of um, a sugar cube. And then we drop it in, into this special, vi uh, uh, it's temperature and control for oxygen and, and, and uh, carboxyl and other things. We uh, mark the location so we can later on put it on with all the pictures online so people can then uh, you know, uh, extract the metadata. And we do a number of things with it. We slice it for doing uh, 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 culture, but also for do, uh, slices, but also for doing long-term recordings. Yeah, and we can perfectly well, we, as I said, we have these robots where we can now do automatic patching, up to eight of them simultaneously, where we can record and inject current, we can inject biocytin, we can do the reconstructions. Um, we do a panel, and all of this uh, is accessible. We do a panel of standard uh, psychoarchitectonics and uh, markers of patho pathology. Uh, we, we just do it routinely. We just want to know this, this information for every one sample. By and large, the samples look, look very good. So here we have one slice where we had, I don't know, 10 neurons that we could inject, record from, and reconstruct. And uh, wait, why is this fuzzy? Okay, this shouldn't be fuzzy. Okay, so these are layer two, three. This is the stuff you think with. If you're gonna remember anything about this lecture, uh, it is because um, neurons like these, so these are layer two, three primal cells in your middle temporal gyrus, take all that sensory input that they get from, let's say, um, a higher order visual cortex and encode it and lay it down as memory uh, many weeks later. 
You can see they're thin, right, because they, that's a thin at 50 micrometer of the slice. So I'm a great believer in that we're all nature children and, you know, we're all conscious. And so I did this at, my, at an old staff where we had 300 people in the audience. And I flashed up onto the screen one cell at a time, not together like here. Uh, different cells, 12 cells, half of which were from mouth, half of which were from human, and I removed it, we removed the scale bar. And then people had a phone applet to guess which one was human, which one is mouse. Can you do this? Okay, so people were on average at chance. Now that's not to say you can't train somebody. So A, of course, uh, this is human. This is, you know, 2.5 millimeter. This is like 700 micron. So that's an obvious way to do. But even if you remove that, you, of course, you can train people to tell the difference, and you can for sure train a deep network to tell the difference. But the overall point is that hardware is just so similar. Although the last common ancestor, right, between us and those guys you probably have here in the basement, <laughs> wild type, is like 60 million years, right? So that's the last common ancestor. But we're sitting upstairs and they're downstairs. <laughs> and why is that? I mean, that's what people always want to know. And most people, at least in the general audience, they want to be told, oh, there's a magic explanation. It's phonoconomo cells. Or it's you know, a special brain area that only we have. And all those explanations, you know, if you look deeper, none of them holds, uh, holds true. We are specialized, but so is the mouse, so is dogs. Each creature is specialized in its own way. And, and the, the biggest difference that people routinely under, uh, um, uh, underappreciate is, uh, is the factor 1,000. The fact that dendritic tree are two times larger, synaptic density is somewhat higher. You know, so it's probably going to be a combination of all these different factors that leads to, to our brain being the, the way it is. So here you can do electrophysiology. So what we discovered was really cool. People were extremely skeptical of this. Look, this is a recording three days after we took it from a human brain. You get beautiful spikes, you get interneurons, you get fast spiking, you can record, uh, act uh, you can record synaptic potentials. So here we plotted for, um, oh, it doesn't show here, uh, no, I have another slide, where we do the same thing for tumor patients versus for epileptic patients. We don't find a difference whether the tissue is taken from one or the other. Here you can see this is time out after slicing, so this goes to three days. Yeah, and there's some, some, there's some trends, like the resting potential goes up a little bit, but by and large, it's incredible stable. You can't do this in a mouse. In a mouse, typically, if the culture is more, if the slice is more than six days, or six hours old, the gradients run down, and you have to throw the slice away. Humans, presumably, because you know we are, we live much longer, you know we may have more antioxidants, we may have more anti-stress factors. We don't really know uh, why it is, but human tissue lasts much longer uh, than um, than um, than rodent tissue. And then you can find, so here we did a study, um, uh, we can find differences, I'm not going to go into this, between human and mouse. So we, we try to, to identify equivalent uh, cells, this is layer two, three pyramidal cells, and you can, you know, you can find differences, whether they're meaningful or not, who knows, between mouse and, and, and human. And then you can, do trans you can do the same thing that we did in a mouse, and now in a human, so you can uh, collect cells. We're doing this in collaboration with Hype Mansfeld in, in Amsterdam and with Gabor Tamas in, um, in Hungary, who really pioneered this technique. So uh, all using stand common standards, we're now doing three modalities at the same time, so-called patch-seek. We're going into human cells. Right now we're doing interneurons and then layer two, three pyramidal cells. We're injecting biocytin and reconstructing the dendrites and the axon. We get the standard electrophysiology. Uh, uh, we suck out the nucleus to do uh, single cell um, transcriptomics on, on that same cell. So in other words, we then get the morphology, the electrophysiology, and the transcriptomics all on the, on the same cell to be able to identify, well, you know, if this is a GABAergic cell, which particular transcriptional type of GABAergic cell uh, is this, which particular type of layer two, uh, layer two pyramidal cell it is. And we're doing this now um, quite routinely. And we also, as I mentioned, we're now using these viral techniques, very exciting, where we can get, these are 
uh, a class of, they make up 20% of the cells here, layer five cells, so-called primal tract that go down to the spinal cord. In the monkey, we've done this. There are many fewer. In the human, we have now a virus that identifies these. They're very specific cells, but they're many fewer. They're only 0.5%, but they project all the way down. And so we're now busy trying to find various promoters for GABAergic cells, for VIP cells, for subsets of GABAergic cells in the, in the human brain. All right, so let me finish. So the bottom line is, I hope I've, I've sort of shown you that believable uh, evidence that in any one cortical areas are going to be on the order of 100 distinct cell types. You know, in some areas it may be 80, in other areas it may be 120, but it's going to be on the order of 10 to the 2. With, the, uh, uh, with most inhibitory interneurons shared across regions, again, it's very difficult to be perfectly general. There may well be some distinct inhibitory cell types, but they seem to be, if they exist, they seem to be in the distinct minority. What remains unclear as of now, how these different uh, properties map onto each other. You know, so how does the morphology, where they project to, the elective physiology, and their genes that express, how does it map onto each other? Does it map onto each other totally one to one? It's unlikely. Um, what are the uh, uh, redundancy and the, de uh, we see redundancy and we see degeneracy, but we need to understand that. By we, I mean the, collectively the field. The brain as a whole, whether it's going to be human and mouse, is going to be on the order of 1,000. Maybe it's 2,000, but you know, on that order. Probably not 10,000, and certainly, certainly much more than 100. So the big question is, particularly for you okay, uh, who think about the brain as a computational machine, that I'm not fully sure is the right way to think about it. But if you do, you're, you're, for, you're, you're confronted with this challenge. What is the function of 1,000 cell types? Uh, from a computational point of view. In particular, when we, I'd like to remind you of this foundational paper of computational neuroscience was published um, almost uh, 80 years ago during the war by McCulloch and Pitts at the time at Chicago and Rashevsky. And they uh, published this beautiful paper. If you haven't read it, you should go out and read it immediately. In which they, they sort of proposed one of the first neural networks model it was a very simple model where they assume neurons are all or none. Inhibition has a, has a veto power. Um, uh, it's a threshold model that they proposed. And then they showed systematically, they showed how any one logical proposition, like, you know, all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, therefore man, uh, Socrates will die, how all such proposition could be mapped onto networks of these neurons. It was immensely influential, it really influenced the way society is organized and, and, and civilization. There's a direct connection between that. Then John von Neumann, uh, uh, his book, uh, Computer and the Brain, that he finished in 57 when he was dying, and Alan Turing, and the rest literally is history. Right, so we, we, we are influenced, we have this profound belief, going back to Leibniz, and probably you can trace it back even earlier to the Greeks, that. Uh, that the brain, not the kidney or not the heart, but curiously only the brain uh, sort of instantiates these, these, um, these, uh, these steps, these operations that we think of computation and that is a primary function of, um, of, um, of the brain, in particular of this, uh, of this cortical uh, tissue. Now we know that simple McCulloch and Pitts neurons are Turing uh, complete, right? So in, uh, in fact we know that just NAND gates or Rule 110 or, you know, game of life. All those things are very simple and they're Turing complete. In other words, anything that can be com computed on a Turing machine with infinite memory can be computed with such simple networks. So why the hell do we need a thousand of these incredible complicated cell types of neurons? What, what do they possibly compute? Okay, you need an, a neuron for doing inhibition and for doing gain normalization, but why do you need 15 types of somatostatin cells and 13 types of, of uh, PV interneurons? And I don't have the answer. Uh, but we, are, we suspect, if, certainly if you read the biological literature, that many of that has to do with developmental reasons. You had, had to develop, your brain had to develop from a single cell. There are all sorts of neurons that we know are pro progenitor of neurons that are expressed transiently and some remain around. Uh, some are evolutionary remnants, no doubt, from re uh, evolutionary ancestors. Some may be there for metabolic reasons. Uh, so, uh, so these are 
other reasons rather than purely um, uh, computation one. But for us of most interest is this. The belief of many of us in biology and in medicine that many uh, diseases, many neurological, di many ophthalmological diseases, eye diseases in, that are specific to the eye, psychiatric diseases and neurological diseases are not just general degenerative di diseases, but at least start out with a specific one or two specific cell types, that they're cell-specific diseases. All right, so there are, for example, um, there are many types of retinal blindness that are not generic damage in the, in the um, eye, but are very specific genes that are missing in the photoreceptor, for instance, or in imacrine cells or in bipolar cells. And so that then gives you a promise to, for, for therapy, because if you can introduce that, that gene, then you can help him. There's this spectacular success now, unfortunately it cost $2.1 million by Novartis, but there's this spectacular success in AV, uh, trial, a single shot AV trial from infants who suffer from uh, SMA, uh, spinal cord muscular atrophy. In many of them it's deadly, they die within two years. It, it, it's a dysfunction of a single gene that's expressed in an, in an alpha motor neuron in the spinal cord. There's now an AV uh, uh, treatment, very successful in 12 children, where not a single one has died, usually 90% 90, 90 die. Um, where, you d where you have a virus that delivers that gene to only those motor neurons. So if we can do this, there's, there's um, evidence that some uh, Parkinson's disease, of course, uh, ALS, uh, myotropic lateral sclerosis, schizophrenia. In many of these diseases, at least a uh, very promising hint that the disease is specific to a cell type or starts out with a specific cell type or a specific synaptic connection among cell types. And so therefore, if you can identify the, the, the subtypes in the human, because mice don't really get Parkinson, they don't really get uh, schizophrenia, uh, if you can identify those in humans, and then, then you have a very promising avenue using AV or other viral vectors to introduce the, the missing or the uh, defunct uh, gene and introduce them back into the patients to alleviate or maybe eliminate the, uh, the symptoms. So plus, in the mouse, of course, or in the monkey, it gives us very powerful uh, tools to perturb. So independent of, of w what the functions of these, we can use them to access the brain in a, in a causal way in, in animals and we can maybe access them to uh, uh, devise more powerful diagnostic tools uh, for the humans. And with that, this is our team at the Allen Institute. And this is our this is our uh, founder who started us all off on this road, particularly the road towards looking at big problems t in large teams and making all the knowledge available for all of humanity for free. Thank you very much.